hundred years ago, cancer was a rare disease. Today, it's at least the second leading cause of death, and in some countries, the first leading cause of death. There's an epidemic of it. What exactly is cancer? Basically, it's an overgrowth of cells that will not die. It's called lack of apoptosis, which means cells are supposed to die after a certain period of time, and they don't. Another theory is that there are abnormal or abnormalities in chromosomes. Too many chromosomes lead to loss of control of the mechanism that leads to death. We also know that there are gene defects sometimes that can be associated with cancer. And of course, there are many environmental carcinogens that are now on a long list by the EPA that tell us that they are causing cancer. We basically polluted the planet. So between the genetic defects, the environmental factors, and the lifestyle factors, you're looking at the cause of cancer. There's a lot we can do about it. It kills tissues by direct extension. So if a cancer is growing in your lung, it may obliterate your lung. Or if it's in a kidney, it may obliterate your kidney. Uh, and of course, it also sends metastases, meaning it spreads itself to other tissues. And the way it does that is actually quite a complex uh, scenario. Cancers don't just go to anywhere haphazard. They may just go to the brain or just to the bone or just to the liver or just to the lung. So the tissues have to be prepared to receive the cancer, which means there's a lot we can do in terms of modifying our biochemistry that might have an effect on that. So the factors that are important in causing cancer really are lifestyle, genetic factors, exposure to radiation, and of course the carcinogens that are in the environment. Lifestyles are one we can probably do the most about. We should eat healthy food, real food, not food products, not something that comes in a cellophane package that has an ingredients list on it. It's got to look like a squash or a tomato or a zucchini. If you get good whole food like that, you're going to be giving your body the, the materials, the raw materials it needs to make the products it needs, to make antioxidants, boost immune defenses, make our immune cells operate more, more effectively. We should make sure we exercise on a regular basis. We know that people who exercise are at a far lower risk of getting cancer and also have a much less chance of their cancer spreading, particularly breast cancers, colon cancers, and prostate cancers. So diet and exercise are huge. Sleep, another huge factor. If you miss just five hours of sleep one night, your natural killer cells, which are those immune cells that fight viral infections and cancers, reduce their efficiency by 30%. And if you sustain that, no surprise that you're going to be at risk for cancer. And it's no wonder that we're getting a lot of cancer from that point of view because we live in the fast track in this country and in many industrialized countries of the world. So we should be paying attention to having a little bit more perspective on that and making sure we get more sleep. What we weigh makes a big difference in terms of cancer spread and in chances of getting cancer for many different kinds of cancers. Of course, what we, th what we think and how we run our lives, uh, what our psycho-spiritual uh, essence is, is a huge factor. We need to know what we're trying to achieve in life, be connected to it, and that makes for happiness hormones. And those, those happiness hormones do a lot to keep us in a good state of health. So there's a lot we can do to prevent getting cancer. Now, you have cancer. What do you do now? This becomes a real challenge because the big C scares the heck out of people. They're sure that if they got cancer, their risk for dying is going to go way up, and a lot of the time that's true. <clears throat> and there's kind of a sense of urgency. You need to do something now. Your doctor may even tell you, you've got to do this sooner than later. And in Western medicine, we only offer three approaches, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. That's it. Why would we limit our therapies to that? Not to say that they don't have effects that are beneficial, because we know they can. And so there should be considerations, but we should be thinking about any therapy in any discipline that's not crazy and not harmful to be considering as a possible treatment for cancer. And that takes a little time. And we should take the time to do that almost always. There are very few cancers that you can't wait for three or four weeks to decide which your course of treatment is going to be, especially when it's going to impact the rest of your life and may impact your family's life as well. There are treatments such as hyperthermia and IV vitamin C, uh, the Gerson therapies, uh, Hoxie therapies, immunoadjunctive therapies. There are hundreds of different kinds of therapies that should be brought to the table in an integrative setting. We should be practicing integrative oncology because it's a style of practice that makes more sense. 
why would you ignore certain therapies just because they're not FDA approved? Maybe because not enough research has been done. If they're dangerous, I would understand that. And that's why I don't generally recommend clinical tri people enter clinical trials because there we know the toxic drugs that are often being used can be real problematic. And yet we feel pressured into it because what else can we do? But most of the, of the uh, complementary alternative medicine therapies are not dangerous. A lot of them are just a change in diet or giving a nutrient of some kind that's a, a, a nutrient that doesn't, a natural substance that doesn't cause any problems. So we should be looking at integrative strategies where we work together at a round table, much like we do uh, when we're doing healing circles, or, or, which you'll find in another section of this, of this site that you should look into because it's a great way to bring together at the same table at the same time practitioners of different disciplines to give you advice and to support you through the, through the uh, illness that you have. Now, prevention is, is something that's important and early detection is important, and we talk a lot about that. There are a lot of tests that we can do, like mammograms and PSAs and colonoscopies, that I've got to tell you are very controversial, particularly in certain individuals. You need to look uh, each of these topics up, and there are plenty of areas on the site will give you information about those, so you can have a perspective that's a little bit broad and more inclusive. So what we're getting to, you have cancer, what are your options? Look at it from an integrative point of view. See what options are out there. Find a trusted person in the mainstream to give you advice about what to do. And find one or two or more complementary and alternative practitioners that are respected in your community and see what they have to say. And have them integrate that into your personal preferences. Because this is your problem. It's your life. You should have a lot to say about what's done. It's within your control. That's a great approach.